This ancient dry lake in California's Antelope Valley is not where man first experienced the awesome thrill of flight. But it is where he continued to seek the unknown. Where he continued to try the untested. Where he continued to reach beyond the horizon. It was just a railroad water stop in the early 1900s, known as Muroc, a reversal of the name of the Coram brothers who settled the area next to Rodriguez or Rogers Dry Lake. A small community grew out of the desolation. In 1934, airplanes based at March Field near Riverside, California, commanded by Colonel Hap Arnold, began flying north to the Mojave Desert lake bed for bombing and gunnery practice. As a result, what came to be called Muroc Lake fell under frequent mock attack. In 1937, virtually the entire Army Air Corps, some 200 aircraft, took part in maneuvers over a 65 square mile concrete hard surface. This preparation was indeed timely, for the winds of war blew strongly in other parts of the world. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked. The United States entry into World War II brought bombardment and reconnaissance units to Muroc. The thousands of men and women who were assigned served with dedication, and as the importance of the base grew, so did the facilities needed to sustain operations. A primary mission was bomber crew and fighter pilot training. The Muroc Maru, often appearing as a mirage on the lake bed, was there to prepare flyers for anti-shipping strikes. Lead crews flying the mighty B-29 Superfortress also called Muroc home for a time during the war. Meanwhile, a new era was dawning at the north end of the lake. This was the United States' first jet aircraft. The Bell XP-59A Era Comet first flew in October 1942. The project was a well-guarded secret, as were many that followed. Some would remain anonymous, others would become famous. Later they would be joined by a series of flying wing designs that would come to have a special meaning. They were both propeller-driven and jet and rocket powered. One was actually a flying bomb. Other pusher-type aircraft were also being evaluated. Of course, some were not stable, and they met with a fate man had experienced since his first feeble attempt at flight. Post-war testing even included advanced models developed by our former foes, as well as our own designs, many not even imagined a few years earlier, including one that could kneel for Navy carrier operations, and a new rocket plane began ground testing, along with the fighters, bombers, and larger, more complex versions of the flying wing. Other large craft came to the dry lake. The B-45 was assembled in a Muroc hangar. The B-46 and the B-47 Stratojet, sleek by any standard, were especially so 
in comparison with the stubby XF-85 Parasite Fighter, which folded its wings so that it could be launched and recovered by its B-29 mothership. The early F-86 gave little hint of the many variations that would follow, yet some aircraft would never number more than one or two. Just five years after America's first jet flight, Captain Chuck Yeager climbed into an experimental rocket craft that was to achieve a significant first for man. The plane was the X-1, the milestone supersonic flight. On October 14, 1947, the sound barrier was broken. Man had exceeded Mach 1, so it was just a start. In six years, the speed would be doubled. And in 16, a craft would pass six times the speed of sound. But these achievements would make the taste of this first triumph no less sweet. As testing continued, the variety of models grew. But the XF-85 remained one of the most unusual. When the little plane was finally tested in the late 1940s, it suffered a major setback. Its canopy was damaged in a contest with the mothership's trapeze apparatus. It would return to fly again, to join craft like the F-92, which would set design standards for later models. The experimental F-88 looked much like its F-101 successor. The D-558-2 Skyrocket was the first craft to fly at twice the speed of sound, while the X-4 provided data on stability and control at speeds under Mach 1. Failure challenged the ingenuity and determination of Muroc engineers and test pilots. Eventually, the Parasite fighter concept was made a success. as were other prototypes. Yet the risk of reaching beyond the horizon was always present. It was never more deeply felt than in June 1948, when a jet version of the flying wing went down with its crew of five. The pilot was Major Daniel Forbes of Kansas, and the co-pilot from California, Captain Glenn Edwards in whose honor the base was renamed in January 1950. A reconnaissance wing was among the new aircraft of the new decade, as was the Regulus, a pilotless vehicle that could be controlled from the ground. Of course, the need for highly skilled pilots was ever present. In early 1951, the test pilot school of the fledgling Air Force was moved from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio, to Edwards. The job of the test pilot was becoming more complex and demanding, even in the Hollywood movies filmed at the base in the 50s. In June 1951, the Air Force Flight Test Center was officially established. The assortment of craft being tested and evaluated had grown tremendously in nine short years. Small trainer aircraft were being put through their paces, as were the heavy giants of the sky. This XB-51 starred in a movie, Toward the Unknown. Prototypes of the B-52, first flown in 1952, were brought to the center to be wrung out. And so it was with each later modification of the mighty Strato Fortress. The B-60 was adapted from the B-36, and the Navajo, whose engines were also developed and tested at Edwards, continued the exploration of pilotless flight. Fighter aircraft development kept pace during the 50s. With the Super Sabre, the numbers had reached 100. The F-100, also demonstrated in zero-length launch, signaled the first of the line known as the Century Series, followed by the F-101 Voodoo, the F-102 Delta Dagger, and the F-104 Starfighter. The 
The F-105 Thunder Chief exceeded Mach 1 on its maiden flight. The F-106 Delta Dart was an extensive modification of the F-102, while the F-107 a radical redesign of the F-100. This jet came complete with a supersonic propeller. The C-123 provider's name described its capabilities. The C-130 was called Hercules. And the C-133, Cargo Master. The KC-135 Stratotanker ushered in a new era for air refueling. As the unusual U-2 did for weather and photo reconnaissance. From the air, the growth of Edwards was becoming more evident as the first housing foundations were cut into the dry earth. The area was made more habitable and the joys of desert living became clearer. In the mid-50s, the base continued to grow in both size and importance. Major facilities were moved from their original site to a new, more northerly location on the lakeshore. Other buildings, including large hangars and support facilities, were added and the base area was expanded to over 300,000 acres. While across the way, on craggy Lehman Ridge, the center's rocket branch was conducting very different kinds of tests. Begun, of course, with the traditional countdown. In another part of the base, Joshua trees bloom next to the rocket sled track, where until 1963, aircraft components and ejection systems were tested. Human endurance was also challenged by Colonel John Staff, who rode test sleds at hundreds of miles per hour and withstood a force over 40 times gravity. He returned to tell about it. However, instrumented dummies like Sierra Sam were used for the more destructive types of testing. Each sled mission was methodically prepared. The rocket bottles were carefully placed. And our friend Sam, all 200 pounds of him, was made comfortable for the ride, which in this case was to test an ejection system. Cameras were ready to record the run at various speeds and from many angles. Although it appears that this mission ended in failure, it was successful in that it led to the development of an improved ejection system. As for Sam, he survived to become an attraction at a 50s Armed Forces Day display on the flight line, along with some of the sleds being used for testing. A working miniature sled track drew the interest of the crowd inside one of the large hangars. Outside, folks had come for many miles to see some of the test aircraft on static display. Especially the research vehicles, which represented man's continuing quest to conquer near space. One such craft was the X-2, 
which, before its untimely end in 1956, made the world's first Mach 3 manned flight. Its test program was the responsibility of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Each facility was also located on the edge of the lake. Other research craft were being flown and evaluated by the NACA in the 50s. Technology was expanding rapidly. Late 1958 marked the arrival of the X-15. At the time Edwards became its home, the NACA became the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA. Meanwhile, Air Force flight tests continued to tax not only the airworthiness of new and experimental craft, but also the courage of those who flew them. This prototype, first flown in 1959, paved the way for both the F-5 Freedom Fighter and this trainer, the T-38 Talon, which was used to set world records at Edwards in 1961. A different record was set when the first class of astronauts graduated from the Test Pilot School's Aerospace Research Pilot Course. They and those who followed would go on to realize many of the space travel dreams of the early 60s. Some of the concepts would not endure, but the people these dreams touched would. Like a young NASA test pilot, Neil Armstrong, then working with the X-15, while across the lake bed, the F-1 rocket engine that would start man on his journey to the moon was being fired for the first time. Other Air Force and NASA pilots would earn their astronaut wings in the X-15. The craft was carried aloft by a B-52 mothership. Precision instruments would track its flight. The X-15 was carried well over 200 miles from Edwards and released at 45,000 feet, returning to the lake bed in less than 10 minutes. Its flight data would be analyzed for years afterwards. The three X-15 vehicles flew a total of 199 missions. It was ironic that the 200th and last flight of the rocket ship was canceled due to a rare desert snowfall. In 1963, the X-21 laminar flow aircraft tested concepts which still hold promise. And the F-4C Phantom began a program which included stall tests like this one. Even with the advent of new fighters, planes of the Century series continued to be modified. This rocket augmented version of the F-104, with reaction jet controls, was used as an aerospace trainer for future astronauts. The Aerospace Research Pilot School, as it was then called, was in full swing in the early 60s, with a highly technical curriculum that included thrilling aircraft maneuvers, moments of weightlessness, and simulated spaceflight and docking. followed by a well-earned graduation and possible selection for programs such as the Manned Orbiting Laboratory and the chance to view the Earth as few men had. The center also played an important role in space capsule recovery. Its parachute test squadron checked out the Apollo spacecraft Earth landing system. The squadron, which tested a variety of recovery and deceleration devices, also explored this unique approach to picking up downed pilots using a parachute and balloon system. In the early 60s, a contingent of Army aviation was established at Edwards, primarily to test helicopters. Craft with vertical takeoff and landing capabilities were not new to the dry lake. 
Some of these test aircraft use propellers or rotors for lift. Others did not. The Lunar Landing Research Vehicle was used to prepare astronauts for moon missions. In composite, the flights of the various crafts tested over the years recall the lilt of a waltz. In 1964, Edwards was visited by President Johnson. He was greeted by the base's military and civilian leaders and their families. The President reviewed several of the aircraft undergoing testing, including the Air Force's new Eurojet cargo carrier, the C-141 Starlifter. A few months later, the first of two XB-70 Valkyrie triple sonic bombers arrived for testing. On a later flight, the multi-million dollar craft experienced landing gear trouble and would not have been able to land safely except for the ingenuity of pilot Al White and Colonel Joe Cotton who crawled to a relay box in the plane's structure and remedied the problem with a carefully placed paper clip. was lost soon afterwards, but the remaining XB-70 continued experimental research and later became part of the Air Force Museum. At about the same time the Great White Bird was being tested, the Blackbird SR-71 and its predecessor, the YF-12, also sliced through the deep blue Edwards sky. and rocket testing continued. The activity was designated the first Air Force Laboratory. Where by mishap, and on purpose, great explosions shook Lehman Ridge. Just as in the late 50s, when the Minuteman missile silo launch concept was first tested, the laboratory developed new rocket technology. And refined proven concepts for the present and future applications. With large engines for mighty boosters, and minute thrust devices. Across the lake bed in April 1965, the flight line was poised for a visit by the nation's vice president. 
Mr. Humphrey toured the Aerospace Research Pilot School and later visited the NASA Flight Research Center, which was involved with such strange-looking vehicles as the Parasev. Toad Aloft, his predecessor of the hang glider, tested a concept for possible applications in the space program. Another craft that was towed in its early flights was the wingless M2F1, the first in a series of lifting bodies that included the HL-10, which would later be used in filming a television series about a bionic man. During the latter part of the 60s, proven swing-wing technology was incorporated in the F-111. Once known as the TFX, this aircraft also demonstrated its terrain-following capability. Tests of the F-111 included water ingestion and a resting gear run, important because the planes of the period were landing at speeds faster than the top speeds of World War I aircraft. Usually, the arresting barrier did its job well. Sometimes, there were complications. A tangle could have been a real problem during this balloon pickup from a C-130. This retrieval system is one way to get a jump on the morning rush hour. The C-5 Galaxy was first tested during the late 60s. The huge plane demonstrated its capability for operating from unimproved surfaces. During the same period, a new attack aircraft, the A-7D, was being evaluated. And wide-body jetliners used Edwards for certification testing. Once again, the worth of the facility was demonstrated, as was the skill of the commercial test pilots. The NF-104 was placed by the test pilot school as a silent monument to this kind of skill. Developed through a rigorous curriculum that required each hand-picked student to learn more about a wider variety of subjects than ever before. The test pilots were being readied for the 1970s crop of new aircraft, like the A-9 close air support prototype, and the A-10, which could carry up to 16,000 pounds of mixed ordnance. It was later fitted with a 30-millimeter GAU-8 gun that could fire thousands of rounds per minute, fast even when filmed in slow motion. New fighter airplanes also came to the lake for testing, including the F-5E Tiger II, and the F-15 Eagle, which was first flown in July 1972. The unknowns of testing were always present. That winter morning in 1974 was no exception. A mishap was averted when the skilled contractor test pilot turned this seemingly ill-fated high-speed taxi test into the YF-16's unofficial first flight. After some adjustments, the plane's official takeoff took place two weeks later. The fighter went on to become one of the most successful craft of its type ever. The YF-16 had competed for continued development with the YF-17, which came on the scene later in 1974. Although the twin-tail twin-engine craft was not chosen for the Air Force, this prototype was to set the basic design for the Navy F-18. This variation of a Boeing 707 with an extensive airborne warning and control capability 
was one of the several heavy craft tested at Edwards in the first half of the 70s. Another, the B-1 bomber, was flown to Edwards from a nearby Air Force production facility in December 1974. While this YC-15, a wide-bodied cargo aircraft prototype, flew to Edwards from its Long Beach, California plant in August 1975, its engines and wing flaps were configured to provide lift for short takeoffs and landings. Meanwhile, a variation of the same lift technology was being developed for the YC-14, which was first flown a year later. Modified space engines were tested, and novel approaches to rocketry continued to be explored at the Air Force Rocket Propulsion Laboratory. A reusable solid propellant test motor called Super Hippo was first fired in 1975, and each day brought with it flight test missions like this one. The aircraft stands ready. Center Commander, Astronaut Thomas Stafford, is briefed. Vital instruments are checked out, and the hundreds of people and pieces of equipment needed for the test become involved as the mission gets underway. refueling, as important to flight testing as it was in the early days, had come a long way since it was pioneered. A special water carrying tanker was used to test the effects of icing on new aircraft. The base and its services continued to grow a far cry from the days when it was no more than a tent city. at Edwards attracted many and varied visitors from the local area and from great distances, as the South American chiefs of staff who came to view the latest test craft and to watch them perform. To experience the freedom of flight.
In the mid-70s, the YF-12 was flown for research. Concepts such as a fly-by-wire computerized control system were tested, as was a supercritical wing. Remotely piloted vehicles continue to be flown over the dry lake, and a detachment of the center tested air launch tactical drones. Piloted drop models were used to evaluate extreme performance characteristics of the full-size craft. Testing also continued with lifting bodies. The X-24B, in its last flight, demonstrated the ability to land on a conventional runway surface. The Space Shuttle Orbiter, rolled out in late 1976, would also land at Edwards following its initial flight. At first, launched from a modified 747 airliner. from its early missions in space. The skilled astronauts would seek out the tiny patch of hard, dry Earth, barely more than a dot on the sprawling landscape, yet not an unlikely spot for so triumphant a return. For it is there that so much aviation and space history had been written. <laughs>